Turn your Bibles to Exodus, Exodus chapter 12, Exodus chapter 12, verse 14, and Exodus chapter 12, verse 14. And as you turn there, I want to invite you all to please follow along in your Bibles. It's something that is extremely important for us to, to do. It's something that is extremely important for each and every one of us as we go through this morning's lesson, as we listen, as we do the things that we do to ensure that we are doing all things in accordance with God's will. So as you um, go through this morning's lesson, I invite you to please follow along and verify all things. If you have a question on anything, please bring it to my attention after services. I would love to talk to you and love to go ahead and look at the scriptures and ensure that we are doing all things in an accurate manner in the way that God has commanded us to do. So in Exodus chapter 12, <clears throat> verse, uh, Exodus chapter 12, verse 14, here in this verse, uh, we, are com we see the command being given uh, under the Mosaic Law for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And here in this, this command, the, the um, Jews or the Israelites were given this command, told that during this Feast of Unleavened Bread, they were not to have any type of leaven for the seven days of this feast. Now, it, it says in verse 14, if you read along with me in uh, verse 14, starting, it says, Now this day uh, will be a memorial to you. And you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. But on the first day you shall remove the leaven from your houses. For whoever, uh, whoever eats anything leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. So when we look at this, we see that they were given specific guidelines. They were given strict guidelines that during this feast of unleavened bread, they were not to have any type of leaven. Um, and... The question that we kind of start to ask is, well, what, what is leaven? And, uh, you know, anybody who's a baker probably knows exactly what leaven is. But just uh, for the sake of us that do not bake, like, you know, I'm not really a baker myself. Um, the International Standard Bible in the Encyclopedia goes ahead and it renders leaven as any agent that is added to flour mixture or is added to liquids to produce a, a fermented state. Uh, it, in ancient times, the Hebrews uh, would go ahead and they would take this fermented dough ball that, that they would take from previous bakings and they would add it to a new lump of dough and that would cause a fermentation. Or sometimes they would mix it in a bowl and they would thin it out and they would add it to flour. And this would cause this fermentation process to, to go ahead. This would cause the leavening agent to spread and then also the uh, bread or the cakes to rise and soften. Now, under the Mosaic Law, there were certain uh, feasts that you see, as you see here, that were that prohibited the use of leaven of any kind. As a matter of fact, even burnt offerings, we see in Leviticus that burnt offerings were not to have any leaven when they were given. But there were some that, that did use leaven, those, those offerings that were not burnt. <clears throat> now, within the New Testament, though, as we move to the New Testament, we see that the, the use or the, the analogy of leaven is used throughout the, the scriptures. And in the New Testament, whenever it's used, a lot of times that it is used, not, not every time, but many times that it is used, it is used to depict that of corruption or the, how corruption can spread in the life of a Christian. And so we see this uh, being said many different times. We see this in, in verses like Matthew, as you see on your screen, Matthew chapter 6, verses 6, where Christ going ahead and talking to the disciples, he tells them to watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And in verse 12, he goes ahead and tells that that leaven is the, the teachings of the Sadducees and Pharisees. In Mark chapter 8, um, it, it's not up on the screen, but Mark chapter 8 verse uh, 15, Christ goes ahead and, and says this again. And he says to beware the leaven of the Pharisees. And he also says beware of the leaven of Herod. Uh, going ahead and pointing out how uh, Herod's wickedness and the things that he was doing and the things that were against God, that was a type of leaven that he was talking about. In Luke chapter uh, 12, verse 1, we see again Christ going ahead and talking about the leaven of the Pharisees. And this time he, he focuses and he says, this leaven is hypocrisy. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, Christ, I'm sorry, Paul going ahead and talking to the, the church there at Corinth, he, he is reprimanding them for the fact that they have allowed this one person that uh, is in their midst to continue to, to do a sinful act. He was having uh, inappropriate relationships with his stepmother. 
And he goes ahead and he says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, he says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Clean out the whole leaven uh, so that you may be a new lump, just as the fact, uh, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. And he says, for Christ, our Passover has also been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Here the, in this verse, you see the leavening that is being talking, talked about by Paul is talking about the malice and the wickedness as, as kind of an analogy that is being used. So that said, when we look at this, the question that I have for you is, should then we as Christians ever want to take on the qualities of leaven? And before we answer so quickly, because we look at those verses and we say, well, I don't want to be equated to leaven. The simple truth is, I believe so. We do want to have some of the qualities of leaven. And what do I mean by that? Last week, we started a series of lessons talking about Christian influence. And we talked about the definition of, of influence. We talked about the power of influence. We talked about how we needed to use influence in this world, how we were called to be an influence in this world. Now today, continuing on that series, I want to go ahead and examine how this questionable example of leaven is actually something that we should emulate, not in the negative standpoint, not as talking about the sin or corruption or hypocrisy in our lives or wickedness in our lives, but in the positive sense. So turn with me to uh, Luke, Luke chapter 13, Luke chapter 13. In Luke chapter 13, verse 18, here, Christ going ahead and giving this uh, another parable. He goes ahead and he gives a parable talking specifically about leaven. In Luke chapter 13, verse, uh, we'll start off in verse 18. Luke chapter 13, verse 18. He says, So he was saying, What is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It is like a mustard seed which man took and threw into his own garden, and it grew and became a tree, the, and the birds of the air nested in its branches. And again he said, What shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. Now here in this instance, uh, we see that leaven is being used again as an analogy, but this time is not being used as an analogy uh, of talking about sin within the kingdom, because that would not make sense. But what it's talking about is the quality or the, the, the um, different qualities, the characteristics that leaven kind of goes ahead and has. And it, it's actually talking about the spread and the growth of the kingdom. The title of today's lesson, if you haven't been looking up there, is really, uh, Let's Be the Leaven. And as we continue our series on the Christian influence, I'd like to take our time this morning to go ahead and look at those qualities that leaven kind of shows us and how we as Christians need to emulate those qualities as we influence the world around us. So, Looking back at Matthew, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, at uh, Luke's account, in Luke, uh, when he goes ahead in, in verse 21, and actually, why don't we go to Matthew's account? Because Matthew says the very same thing in Matthew chapter 13, verse 33. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 33, which was read for us, Matthew goes ahead and he, he gives us this same parable, and that same parable of the leaven. In, uh, and, uh, and how it was also put in. So when we look at this parable, what is the first thing that we see? What's the first quality that we are able to make out? The first thing that we must understand is that when we look at this first quality of leaven, we must emulate the fact that it needs to mix. Mixing it is essential for the, the actual spread in the dough, to be that influence. So we also need to understand, when we look at that verse, and we see that a woman goes ahead and hides this leaven in three pecks of flour. The three pecks of flour is just statin. It, it's their way of measurement. And under the old law, it, or under the old um, uh, 
the Old Testament and, and when they talked about statin, it was about seven to, to ten quarts of flour. This is a large quantity of flour and they, she hid this small amount of this peck of leaven. And here, the point that I want to make is that without the leaven that is being added into the bread, the bread will not rise. I think that's pretty obvious. See, when we look at leaven, the fact is we as Christians also have to understand that we have to add the word into the world. We need to mix with the world. We need to be that like that leaven and make an effort to speak to the lost. We talked about that this morning where we talked about the fact that we as Christians need to look at the lost as lost souls and that we need to bring the word to them. We need to bring them in, not just look for the people that were already here, but look for those that are outside. We need to be that influence on the lost. The truth is, if we never go ahead and mix, we never have an, uh, any type of relationship, any, any type of care for anybody that's outside, the simple truth is that we will never have an influence on their lives. We will never have any influence at all. I mean, how many of us have an influence on the car dealership guy? We don't even know who the car dealership guy is. And he doesn't know who we are. So he will never be influenced by us and we will never be influenced by him unless we add something to his life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul goes ahead and he, he, he makes this, this kind of analogy stick using a different kind of uh, a way of looking at it. And he talks about how he, he's reprimanding the church at Corinth for going ahead and dividing or causing divisions amongst themselves because they're, they're looking at who baptized them as a way to separate who's better than who. And then he goes ahead and he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, he talks about how I planted and Apollos watered and God caused the increase. The point that he is making is that God is the focus, that he has done all things and, and that the man is not really of importance. But he does go ahead and point to the fact that I planted, I did something, I went into the world and started to sow the seed. And Apollos, he came back and he was also watering, he was teaching, he was helping. So they each had a unique quality, something that they were doing, something that they were adding to those that were lost. Each person played a part, but God was the one who did the rest. And that's what we need to understand. See, our point is to do our very best and let God do the rest. Let him do the rest. Now, this doesn't mean that, I, and I'm by no means saying that we need to be unequally yoked with those that are outside, those that, that do not believe and do not follow the things of the scripture, and that we should be just, you know, just all with that person. That's not what I'm saying because that would go against what we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, where we're told not to be unequally yoked with them. And I'm not saying that we should be indulging in the, the, the practices that they're doing, the things that are against God and, and doing the things of, of, of darkness, because that would go against what we see Paul saying in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11. But what I am saying is that we as Christians need to be willing to go ahead and have some interaction, to have some type of relationship with those that are outside in the world that we need to make some type of influence on them, that we need to actually go ahead and talk to them. Because the simple truth is that our responsibility to go with them, to, to go and talk to them, is something that we see even by Christ, our Lord. See, when we were talking this morning we were in Luke chapter 5, verse 27 through 32, remember how Christ is going ahead and he is being looked at by the Pharisees as eating with the tax collectors and the sinners. And they look at him and they're like, why is, your, why is he doing this? Why is he eating with the tax collectors and sinners? He knows who they are. Look, they're tax collectors. They're sinners. Brethren, Christ's response here, again, he goes ahead and he says, it is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have come to call the righteous, not to call the righteous, but the sinner. Again, we talked about this morning. It isn't that he was saying that they were all righteous and they didn't need Christ. No, he's saying that I came for the one that needs and that is looking for me. But what does that mean for us? That means for us that we might have to 
go ahead and deal with someone that does not follow the things that we follow. That we might have, to, we might have a relationship with someone that doesn't meet or even look at the scriptures or may even dismiss the scriptures altogether. But yet we have an influence on their lives. Whether it's family, whether it's friends, whether it's coworker, whoever it may be, we may be the only influence they have for the gospel. You see, Paul even mixed in this manner. Look in, in 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, here Paul is going ahead and he's rebuking the church for not going and, uh, and, and saying something or doing something about this man, we, which we, we alluded to before. But look at what he says in verse 9, because he's saying, look, you need to separate yourself from him. You need to let him know what he is doing is incorrect. But in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, he says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. Okay. In verse 10, he says, I did not mean with the immoral people of this world or you or with the covetous or, and the swindlers and the idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any kind, any so-called brother, if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or, swind and, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Why does Paul make a distinction between the two? Why is he going ahead and he's saying, you know, there is, oh, I'm sorry. There is a distinction between those that, uh, that are lost and that are revilers and swindlers, but those that are Christian, there's a distinction that he's making to the two. Because the simple fact is, if we just separate ourselves from every person that has done all things or is not doing the things of Christ, then we are separating ourselves from the entire world. And then we can have absolutely no influence on them. We can actually, we can't teach them the word. We, are, we have no relationship with them. But... What he is saying is those that have accepted Christ, that those who have accepted and understand the word and have come to Christ and then have rejected it, then have thrown it away, then are now living in sin despite knowing what Christ did, despite going ahead and coming out of sin, despite going ahead and being baptized for the remission of his sins. Now that person has separated themselves from Christ and they've thrown it away. And Paul says, you need to go ahead and not associate with that person. Why? Because it helps them to understand what they have done wrong, and then you are trying to draw them back. They need to understand that there is a, that influence that they used to have, the fact that you were in their life is no longer in their life. And that should help them to spurn them to, to kind of come back. But you know, look at what Paul also says in, in chapter six of that same chapter. In chapter, uh, uh, in that same book, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, he also goes ahead and he says, look, just in case we thought, well, this, this, is, this is everybody else. This isn't talking about Christians. Look at what he says in verse 9. He says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor infeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, uh, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Great. Okay. Got it. But look at what he says in verse 11. In verse 11, he says, such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. So what is he saying? He said, you were those lost. You were the one that was lost and doing and practicing these very vile things that were against God. But you were justified, you were cleansed, and you are no longer that. Telling us that those are the people we're seeking. Those are the people that are, are and we need to bring into Christ. But some might say, well, well, okay, but for what reason? Why do I really, do I really need to do this? What real reason is there for me to do this? Well, brethren, I will tell you, it is a command. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 down, uh, Christ going ahead and telling his, his disciples, he gives them the great commission, we call and he tells them specifically to go, therefore, and make, all dis make disciples of who? He says, of all nations. Well, who are the all nations? Is he talking about Christians? No, he's talking about those that are outside of Christ. Because he turns around and he says, baptize them. After you teach them and make them, you baptize them, and then you teach them again. Well, 
that cannot be a person that's already been saved. That's a person that's not saved. That's a lost. We are commanded to do the same thing because we might look at that and say, well, that's to the, that's to the apostles. We don't have to do that. That's, that's not applying to me. But we see that that is applying to us. Look in Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, Paul going ahead and he's talking to the, Rome, the church at Rome and he tells them in, in chapter 10, verse 17, he says, he, uh, uh, the faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Okay. But look at verse 13. In verse 13, he says, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay. Verse 14, how then will they call on him who they have not believed? And how will they believe on him who they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent just as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Here Paul is saying, faith comes by hearing, but that hearing needs to come by somebody delivering it. That there's a point for us to go ahead and deliver that message, to go ahead and bring that message so that we can save those that are outside of that message. Let us not forget that Christ calls us, as we talked about last week, and as that song that we sang this, uh, this morning, right before the lesson, we are called to be the light of the world. We're called to be the salt of the world, have an influence on the world with a purpose of sharing the word of Christ to others. But remember, it's more than just going ahead and speaking the word. It's more than just going ahead and saying the word. It is doing the word, adhering to the word, showing it through our actions. You know, when we talk about the parables and we talk about the parable of the Good Samaritan, I want you to think, if you were that person that was sitting on the road and people had just passed you by, and you are, are beaten, and you are hurt, and this person comes, and he takes you out of that. Not knowing who you are, he rides you up, he goes, puts you on the donkey, takes you to the inn, goes ahead, and has you taken care of, pays for, for your stay, ensures that you are taken care of, and then pays for the rest of your stay, and then leaves. I don't know about you, but would that have that person, would they, what they say, would that have any influence on me at all? If they came and they told me the reason I do this is because I love Christ and I love you. Would that have an influence on me? Would that have an effect on me? That would definitely have an effect on me, especially if I didn't know Christ. Because then I would want to know what's different about this person because everybody else passed me by. But this person did something different. This person actually helped me, not just by saying, be well, not by saying, I'll pray for you, but by doing something about it, by going ahead and, and getting their hands dirty. And that means that's going to take time, that's going to be, take effort, that's going to be talking, that's going to be actually having to invest something. Here in the parable of the Good Samaritan, he invested not only time, but he invested money. He invested uh, just the, his own plans. Everything was taken away to go ahead and assist this person that he knew nothing of. So in addition to this, though, we look at the second thing. Here we see in that, that parable, again, of the leaven, we are told the second quality that we as Christians should emulate is the fact that we need to have a persistence about us. See, just as leaven has a persistence, it works in a persistent manner. Again, going back to that parable, this woman hides a peck of, of that leaven in that flour, and then it leavens until when? Until it's all leavened until it's completed. The leaven had no fanfare. It just did what it needed to do. It just went ahead and did, why? Because that was its, that's what its purpose was. That's what it was compelled to do. We must be the same exact way. In Romans chapter one, verse 14, when Paul's talking to the church at Rome, he has never been to Rome. And he says, I want to be there. I want to go and be with you. And in verse 14, he says, I am under obligation. See, I'm indebted, not just to you, but to everyone. To do what? To preach the word, he says in verse 14, of verse 15. I'm eager to preach the gospel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 
verse 16, Paul goes ahead and he brings it out a little bit further. He says, for if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast about. For, he goes, for I am under compulsion. I am being, something's driving me to do this. And he says, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Do we act that way with the gospel? Are we the same way with the scriptures? Does something compel us to bring out the scriptures to another, to help them? See, the fact is, leaven doesn't stop going ahead and, and acting on that dough. It continues. The spreading power of leaven is that even a small amount goes ahead and effectively and persistently goes and spreads through that dough. It goes through the entire thing. So what does that tell us about us? Sometimes, brethren, we're looking for the big thing. Let me do the big thing. But you see, leaven, just a small amount, goes ahead and has a huge effect. It, sometimes it isn't the big thing that we need to be looking for. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't try and do big things, but it means the small things matter too. The fact that we can do so much, we are given talents of all types. In Romans chapter 12, that's exactly what he's saying. He's saying, look to make sure that we exercise our gifts accordingly, whatever gifts they are, whatever talents they are. Well, what talents do we have? Do we have any talents? Maybe it's preaching. Maybe it's song leading. Maybe it's just sending out a card. Maybe it's saying hello. Maybe it's going ahead and handing out pamphlets. Maybe it's speaking the word. Maybe it's helping another person when they're in need. Maybe it's investing time. Or you know what? Maybe it's just simply inviting someone to services. The fact is we all have the ability to have an influence on someone and to go ahead and share that with them. God doesn't ask us to do these monumental tasks. He just simply asks us to do with what we have been given and do it for him with all we have. Amen. In Galatians chapter 6, in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, we're told that, you know, there's sometimes we get discouraged. Sometimes we see or we do things and, and we don't see the, the, the effect right away and we get discouraged. But here Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, he says, Let us not be discouraged in doing good, for in time, in due time, we will reap if we do not become weary. So then, while we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people and especially those who are in the household of faith. Here Paul says, it doesn't matter what, what comes out of it. Do your very best because your reward is in heaven. That's what you're looking for. You're not looking for them to give you the thank you. You're not looking for somebody to give you the pat on the back. What you are looking for is to make a difference in someone else's life and lead them to Christ. Yes, sir. So what, what else do we see? The next thing that we see about this, uh, this quality of leaven. The third thing, not, on, not only do we have to make contact and we have to be persistent to spread the word, but also we need to have this unchangeability about us. See, leaven, it's mixed with that dough, but it still is leaven. It doesn't change it. It continues to be the leaven in the dough, and it causes an influence. It does not become influenced by that dough. And we need to understand that's the same thing with us. Last week, we talked about that parable that is found in... Uh, um, <clears throat> when we looked at Matthew chapter 5 in verses 13 to 14, where, where he talked about the parable of the, the light and the salt. And remember he said that the salt can lose its flavor. And we talked about that salt doesn't lose saltiness, but it can be corrupted by the things outside. If it allows it to be influenced, if something influences from outside, moisture or whatever it may be, it can be corrupted by those things that are outside and lose its flavor, and then it becomes worthless. As leaven, we cannot allow ourselves to be influenced by the world, but become the influence of the world. You see, the fact is, when we look at this, 
As I told you before, you know, before we said, hey, you need to mix with the world. And that's true. We, 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 we're going to walk out these doors and we're going to mix with the world. They're going to be there. But that doesn't mean that we become the world. See, we, just as Christ talked about his disciples, remember he said that they were of the world, um, but or they are not of the world. They are in the world, but not of the world. As he went ahead and gave his prayer in John chapter 17, verse 14. But just like this, we need to understand then if we are not of the world, we're in the world, but we're not of the world, then what does that make us? It makes us like this leaven, a foreign substance. It makes us different. It makes us unique. It makes us strangers, aliens to that dough. Well, Peter goes ahead and talks about this same exact thing. He goes ahead and tells us, you know what? Your citizenship isn't here. You, a lot of times we look at this world and we look at the state or the, you know, the United States and it's, it's, I'm so thankful that I'm here in this country. But that's not my focus. I'm not, I don't take pride in just being uh, uh, from America. That, that's great. But where is my citizenship? What is my focus? My focus is the kingdom of God. That is the citizenship that we are supposed to be holding in on and continuing to go ahead and focus on. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 12, this is why Peter says, Beloved, I urge you as foreigners as str and strangers to abstain from the fleshly lusts which wage war against your soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that by the things that you do, by the, f the differences, the uniqueness that you have, the fact that you are practicing the word and nobody else is, those things say something about you and it says who you are focused on. Because the truth is we have already, even though we may not think so, we've already overcome the world. Now somebody say, well, what do you mean we've overcome the world? We've overcome the world through Christ. We have, through the blood of Christ, been able to be taken away from the sin that is this world. But we have to continue in it. We have to continue to do and act and, and, and function the way that the Lord has asked us to. So let's look at the last thing. The last kind of uh, quality that we gain from leaven. The, the last thing that we see is that leaven cannot... Uh, or cannot just go ahead and be entered without causing a change. There is a change that actually occurs by leaven. The dough doesn't rise without it. We talked about that briefly. Anyone who has ever baked and has failed to put in that leaven, you know, fa failed to put in that one thing, that yeast, or has put in the leaven and it has not activated. We all know what, what the result is. You end up with this edible brick that, that does not rise. Well, we, why is that? It's because without the leaven, it doesn't cause that chemical reaction. It doesn't go ahead and expand. It doesn't give the gases that help it to rise. It doesn't do all the things it's supposed to. Well, brethren, if we don't go ahead and put that leaven inside the world, put the word of God out there for others to hear, go ahead and help them to see the truth, there is no rise. There is no effect. There's nothing. Anyone, as we look at the scriptures, anyone can see that as Christians, we are called to bring that word to others, to the world. But what is it what we're bringing? What is the leaven that we are supposed to bring? And that is Christ crucified. The fact that he died for our sins. The fact that he was resurrected for our sins and that he brought us out of sin through his blood. And on the final day that we will be raised with him. Let me go ahead and give you one last verse. In 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 13, here Paul is going ahead and he's talking about uh, how if Christ, if the 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 resurrection of Christ has not, if it, was, if it didn't occur, if it didn't happen, then there would be 
kind of these effects that would take place. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 13, he says, But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith is also in vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses. And then he goes on and he says, Then those who have fallen asleep, in verse 18, they have perished. If we are focused on only this word and uh, only this world and the word of Christ only really helps us here and there is no resurrection, the simple fact is all of the things that come with it don't apply. And therefore we are not saved and we won't be raised. We need to bring Christ to every single person. We sing, bring Christ your broken heart. We are needing to go ahead and do that. So what are the applications that we can take from this? You know, when we look at the power of leaven and we talk about the power of leaven, the simple truth is the power to do evil and to influence the world in evil is the same power that we can influence in good. The difference is our focus. What is our focus? Is our focus on self? Is our focus on worldly wisdom? Is our focus on pleasure? Is the focus on me? If that's the focus, then I'm going to be the one who corrupts the world. But if my focus is Christ and his kingdom and delivering his kingdom and helping another to see his kingdom, then I will be that leaven of Christ. So going back to that beginning, the question is then for you, are you really Christ's leaven of the world? Are you having your focus right? Are you going ahead and making the contact, inserting the word into this world, being persistent, retaining your identity, and then bringing about change through Christ? Are you doing that? If you're one who has not accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, has not accepted him the way that he has asked, come to him and then repented of your sins and been baptized for the remission of your sins, I will tell you right now, you are still in a state of being lost. You are condemned with your sins, but you can change that by just accepting the Lord in the manner that he asks. But if you're one who has already accepted Christ and looks at your life and notices, you know what, I haven't been influencing anyone in a good manner. I haven't been doing the things that I'm supposed to. As I look at my life, I see that I am the wrong type of leaven. Well, you can change that today too. If you're one who is in need in any way, if we can help you in any way, if we can talk with you, help you, look, and even bring you to the watery grave of baptism, please come forward as we stand and sing the song of encouragement.